Hello once again, we're going to talk here about normal labor and delivery and just like anything else in medicine, you want to understand normal first. That's why you take physiology in your first year of medical school and not pathology because you need to understand normal in order to understand abnormal and I will follow this video up with a video entitled Abnormal Labor and Delivery and that will talk about the things that can go wrong. Now we're going to parenthetically talk about a couple things that can go wrong because it's closely related, uh, very closely related to the things that are supposed to happen normally and it will kind of help you understand what normal is because of why abnormal is abnormal, but I really just want to focus here on normal labor and delivery. So just a friendly reminder, if you can, subscribe to my Patreon page just chip in a dollar a month if you can. It helps keep these videos free. As you probably uh, know, it takes a lot of uh, research and dedication to put these videos in, and uh, it really helps out. I have to take time away from my family and time away from my job in order to make these videos. So just chip in a dollar a month makes a world of difference. Thanks in advance. All right, so we're going to talk about fetal orientation, lie, presentation, position, attitude, and station. Uh, these are important because, again, when we're talking about abnormal uh, delivery, uh, a lot of the things that go wrong are the fetal orientation. We're going to talk about maternal changes. This is changes to the mom's body, to her cervix. And again, this is going to be something that you'll see all the time on the L&D ward on notes. You want to know what these mean uh, because this is how we monitor mom's progress during delivery. And then you want to know the stages of labor. We're going to talk about normal stages of labor. We, we're going to talk about the upper limit of normal, particularly the time uh, that the mom should be in each of these stages, and the definition of these stages. There's three stages of delivery uh, that occur. Uh, there's really a fourth stage, too, but we're going to talk about the three stages of labor. So you want to know these because when we talk about abnormal labor and delivery, we're going to talk about... Uh, what happens and how you manage it if the stages are, are prolonged or if they're arrested. Okay, so fetal lie. What is fetal lie? So you have a horizontal and a vertical axis. Okay, and your vertical axis is if you're, if you're standing up, you draw a line down your head all the way to the floor. That is your vertical axis. And when we talk about fetal lie, we're talking about the relationship between the fetal vertical axis and the maternal vertical axis. Now, how do you think we want these axes to be related? What part of the head do we want, oh, sorry, what part of the body do we want coming out of the cervix? We want the head to be coming out of the cervix. And so you want the fetal and maternal vertical axes to be parallel. Okay? You want the head to be towards the floor if mom is standing up. Just like mom's head, if you draw a line, goes down to the floor. So those axes, those vertical axes of mom and baby will be parallel. That is what we want. Okay. Now, as we're going to see, you can have a longitudinal lie where the axes are parallel, but you have a problem on hands. Okay, And that would be a breach presentation where the baby's head is at the top and the butt is at the bottom. That's not what we want, but that's still a longitudinal lie. So not all longitudinal lies are normal, but all normal cases will be longitudinal lie. A transverse lie is the total opposite. So in this case, the baby's vertical axis is perpendicular, more or less perpendicular to the mom's vertical axis. Now, it might not be a perfect 90 degrees, but more or less a perpendicular relationship between the axes. And I'll show you a picture of this in a little bit. And then an oblique lie is somewhere in between longitudinal and transverse, kind of diagonal. Okay, so here's a picture. This is a vertex presentation, longitudinal lie. You can see that the vertical axis is, in, is parallel to mom's vertical axis. On the other hand, transverse lie, they're perpendicular. Now, you can have a longitudinal lie where the head is at the top and the butt is at the bottom. This is bad, this is breach, okay? And so we're gonna talk about breach on the next slide here. So fetal presentation. What is presentation? It's the part of the body that is engaging at the, the pelvis. So what do we want engaging at the pelvis? We want the head to engage at the pelvis. Not just the head, but the top of the head, okay? This, the cephalus, the cephalic part of the skull. 
Okay, so a cephalic presentation is normal. This is what we want. We want the head to present first. This will be consistent with an easy vaginal delivery most of the time. Now, if the face presents, then we call that a facial presentation. And this is not so much a problem with the baby's lie as much as it's a problem with those cardinal movements of delivery, uh, the fetal attitude, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So in this case, the face presents first. A breech presentation, we already kind of alluded to, but in this case, the formal definition of a breech presentation is where the legs or the buttocks present first. Now, you want to know the different classifications of breech presentation, and I listed them here. Complete, frank, and footling. So a complete breech is where the thighs and the legs are flexed. So the, the thighs, we're talking about the hips here, and the legs, we're talking about the knee joint. So a complete breech is where the thighs and the legs are flexed. The baby is basically sitting uh, with knees up on the cervix. A frank breech is where the thighs are flexed and the legs are extended. So here's a picture of a frank breech. Thighs are flexed, legs are extended. And so the feet are in the face. And that's how I like to remember it. With a frank breech, the feet are in the face. F, F, F. And believe me, F, F, F is what you're going to be saying if you have a frank breech. And then a footling breech, both the thighs and the legs are extended. So the baby is basically standing on the cervix. And so you see a picture of that here. Now there's two ways you can divide footling breech. A single footling, which would be this illustration right here, where one foot is crossing the symphysis pubis. And then there's a double footling breech, which is a little bit more rare because you have to fit more of the baby past the symphysis pubis through the pelvic inlet. Okay. Then there's two other presentations, a compound presentation, which is poorly defined, but that's where more than there's more than one presenting part. And that can be all sorts of different uh, ways that that can show up, but usually it's going to be the head and the shoulder presenting, kind of cockeyed. And then there's the shoulder presentation where the shoulder presents first. And this is these are usually associated with something called a syncletism, which I will allude to very briefly. Okay, now there is something called fetal position. Now, when we're talking about fetal position, we're talking about a presenting part and its relationship to the maternal pelvis. Now, on the USMLE, if they give you any question that involves fetal position, they're going to be talking about a cephalic presentation. Okay, where uh, our, our definition of fetal position is going to be related to the occiput. The occiput, remember, is the back of the head. Now, when we do a physical exam, how do we know where the back of the head is? We can't always see the baby. A lot of times we have to feel for it. Well, the back of the head, what's at the back of the head? There's something called the posterior fontanelle, and that's kind of a triangular soft spot. And if you can feel that, then you know exactly what the fetal position is. So there's a convention for defining the fetal position. And what we do is we take the maternal side, be it anterior, posterior, left, or right, the presenting part, which when we're talking about a cephalic presentation, we always use the occiput, and then anterior, posterior, or and transverse. Okay, so for instance, you can have occiput anterior. What does that mean? That means that if mom is laying down delivering, baby is facing the floor. On the other hand, you could have occiput posterior. That's the total opposite. Baby is coming up with the face towards the sky. A lot of nurses will refer to this as sunny side up because the baby is coming out and the face is looking right at you. That's not ideal, but it's not as bad as some other things that could happen. Okay, there's also transverse. So transverse can be left or right. So if it's left occiput transverse, that means the baby is going to be coming out looking to the right. The occiput is going to be on mom's left side. And then right occiput transverse, the baby's occiput is going to be on mom's right side. And then there's ROA, LOA, ROP, LOP. Uh, that's just in between anterior and transverse. Okay, so with ROA, the occiput is in between occiput anterior and right occiput transverse. Now, it's normal to be in any of these positions at a certain time. Uh, if you have already read about the, the cardinal positions uh, cardinal movements of labor, uh, you'll know that there's internal rotation and external rotation, 
And so the baby's occiput is going to be rotating all along. Uh, so none of these are necessarily normal or abnormal. They're normal or abnormal based on where the baby is at, whether the head has already been delivered or if it hasn't been delivered yet. Okay, and, so, and as I said, uh, to determine the position, all you do is you feel for that posterior fontanelle. That's the back of the head or the occiput. Okay, so just another slide. And LOT, ROT, it doesn't really matter both transverse positions are, are, are really the same. LOT is just a little bit more common. Okay. So fetal attitude. This is the degree of flexion and extension of the fetal head. Now, again, the head can be either flexed or extended, and either can be normal. It just depends on what or where the baby is in the process of delivery. So at the time of presentation, before the head is delivered, we want the baby's head to be flexed because that keeps the widest part of the baby's head in alignment with the widest part of the maternal pelvis. Okay, we don't want the the, the widest part to be in in uh, conjunction with the narrowest part of the maternal pelvis because then it won't be able to get through. Uh, so it, we want total complete flexion uh, during presentation. It's only after the baby's head has began to clear the symphysis pubis when we want the baby's head to begin to flex, or sorry, begin to extend. Okay, so maximal flexion, that would be chin to chest. That's ideal at the time of presentation, at the time of engagement. Okay, after the baby crosses the symphysis pubis, baby's head crosses the symphysis pubis, then it begins to extend, and that's one of our cardinal movements of labor, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So there's a variety of ways that this can be related. Vertical uh, attitude is maximal flexion. The military attitude is where there's some flexion, uh, but not maximal flexion. The brow attitude, you can see how this is changing the presenting part kind of here. Brow attitude means there's some extension, and facial attitude means there's maximal extension. Extension of the head is just basically like you're looking up at the sky, you're extending your head. Now, if you have a facial attitude, in most cases, you're going to have a facial presentation. Okay, so let's look at some pictures here. Here's baby coming out. If you're looking at, if you're standing over mom, okay, what position would this be in if you're standing over mom? Well, here's the occiput, mom's left side over here. So this would be left occiput, uh, left occiput transverse, okay, be on baby's, uh, or on mom's left side, okay, left occiput transverse and the head is flexed. Now here, you don't have total flexion. The chin is not up against the chest. Okay. And then here, you see that it's even, it's actually more extended. Okay, this is the brow presentation. And then uh, here you have a facial presentation. Okay. So this would be a facial presentation. Okay. So vertical, military, brow, and facial attitudes. And this would be usually consistent with a facial presentation. Okay, there's something called syncletism. And syncletism is a, the relationship uh, between the pelvic uh, inlet and the bitemporal, uh, I guess they call it the occipital frontal plane here, but basically if you were to draw a line from temple to temple, it's that axis of the baby's head. We want those to be parallel. Okay, if they're not parallel, baby's head can get wedged in the pelvic inlet. Okay, so you can see that that's happening here. Okay, and there's anterior and posterior. Okay, but this is, uh, this is asyncletism, and this is a problem. Baby's head is not going to get out properly if it's wedged in the pelvis. Okay, so we want those planes to be parallel. And this is not super high yield for USMLE, but you can you can see here you get an idea of looking at these different uh, at these different positions that if something goes wrong, it's going to make it hard to deliver vaginally. It doesn't mean you can't deliver vaginally; it just means it's going to be harder. Okay, now fetal station. This is really really important because if you've ever been on an L and D ward, you'll know that station is commonly given on progress notes. Okay, you'll see minus two station or plus one station. What does that mean? 
Station just refers to the descent of the fetal presenting part relative to the maternal ischial spine. And you can easily feel the ischial spine when you do a vaginal exam. And so station is expressed in relationship to the ischial spine, be it above the ischial spine or below. Now, what do you think is further along in the delivery process? Below, okay? That means that you've passed the ischial spine. So we define that as a plus, even though it's quote unquote below, we define that as a plus. Okay, so minus three station means that the, the fetus's head, baby's head, is three centimeters, uh, I guess if mom is standing up, uh, superior to the ischial spine. Okay, it's three centimeters before the ischial spine. If it's plus two, it means it's two centimeters beyond the ischial spine. Anatomic terms never work really well for L and D. Okay, so now moving on to the maternal changes. So cervical effacement. Effacement is a process that is necessary for delivery. Remember that mom has a cervix, and that cervix is, in most women, cervix is about three to four centimeters long. Now, for our purposes, we consider two centimeters to be uh, minimal effacement. So two centimeters is going to be zero percent effacement. And the process of effacement is something that occurs early on in labor, very early on, uh, really in the uh, latent stage one of labor. And effacement should be about 100% uh, by the time you go into active labor. So effacement, what you have is a shortening of the cervix, okay? Because that the baby can't fit through the cervix. The cervix is it's got to be very very thin for the baby to get through. And, and this whole process is actually mediated by prostaglandins and oxytocin. And th that works biochemically to break the disulfide linkages in collagen. Collagen is mostly what comprises the cervix. Uh, so during the, the labor process, you actually have this thinning of the cervix. You have a, a molecular change in the cervical tissue. So when you're trying to figure out what the effacement is, you just... Try to feel how long the cervix is, and then you divide it by two centimeters, and that's your percent effacement. Okay, so at 100% effacement, the cervix is pretty much just a thin membrane. And effacement is primarily happening during latent stage one of labor. So effacement, as mentioned, coincides with increasing levels of prostaglandins and oxytocin. We can give prostaglandins to help move effacement along, and these are called cervical ripening agents. So misoprostol or cytotec is one of them. You can also give dinoprostone, mifoprostine. These are cervical ripening agents. Another way you can quote unquote ripen the cervix is with something called laminaria. And laminaria is actually from a seaweed and this will uh, shorten the cervix. And actually in a long time ago, in, I don't know, ancient times, it used to be used as an abortifacient, but now we use it to help progress labor. So this is effacement. This is a graphical uh, view of effacement here. You can see normal looking cervix here. Cervix is just shortening up. It kind of funnels down. And this is 100% effaced. And you've got to be 100% effaced to deliver the baby. And full effacement will happen quite a few hours before the actual delivery happens. So then there's uh, dilatation. And dilatation is primarily going to occur during active labor. Most of it occurs during active labor. But dilation is very, very, very important for defining what stage mom is in, okay, as we're going to see when we talk about the stages of labor. So really, this is just a feel thing. Uh, a two centimeter dilation is going to be about one finger length in diameter, and then two fingers is about three and a half, three is about five and a half, four is about seven and a half, but it's really just a feel thing. Okay, but what you should know is that 10 centimeters dilation is consistent with the beginning of the second stage of labor, which we'll talk about in a little bit. I feel like I say that a lot. Okay, so here we are at the stages of labor. First off, what is labor? What's the technical definition? Labor is regular contractions accompanied by cervical change. Now, you can have contractions and not have cervical change. What is that? That's often described as Braxton Hicks contractions. 
which are irregular contractions that are not accompanied by cervical change. And a lot of first-time moms will think she's, she'll think she's going into labor when, in fact, she's just having irregular contractions. That's not coinciding with cervical change, so that's not labor. Okay, regular contractions, furthermore, is defined as every, a contraction every five minutes where the contractions are lasting 30 seconds or more. Okay, so every five seconds, or every five minutes, 30 seconds or more. And that's at least every five minutes. So if it's more than that, then it's still labor. It's still regular contractions. So you have to have both. You have to have regular contractions and cervical change. And cervical change means effacement uh, and or dilation. So stage one of labor is the whole, the whole process is effacement and dilation. So stage one is defined as closed to full dilation. So it's, it's as soon as those contractions start and then the cervi cervix begins to change all the way to the point where the cervix is fully effaced and fully dilated. So you have 100% effacement, 10 centimeters dilated. That's stage one. So closed to full dilation. We further divide up stage one into latent and active. Latent is from closed to three to four centimeters dilated. Some will use three, some will use four. It doesn't matter. Okay. When you look at the curve, which I'll show you next, uh, you'll see that latent, the latent stage is really a very slow progress of dilation. Mostly what's going on in the latent stage is effacement. Once you hit about three to four centimeters, you'll be about fully effaced by that point. Then things really begin to pick up as far as dilation is concerned. And at that point, uh, the, the fetal head becomes engaged and the cardinal movements begin to occur. So stage two, remember now, is after stage one. So at this point, the cervix is 10 centimeters dilated. And at that point, the mom can begin to push. You don't want her to push before stage two because she's pushing against a, a, a smaller cervix. And it's already hard enough for baby's head to get out uh, uh, the cervix the way it is against that 10 centimeter uh, hole. Uh, so you don't want her to push before stage two where the cervix is dilated to 10 centimeters. So stage two is full dilation to all the way till the delivery of the fetus. Okay, so when mom is pushing, she should be in stage two. Okay, that's 10 centimeters dilated, fully effaced, all the way to the delivery of the fetus, now the baby. And stage three, then, is the delivery of the fetus to the delivery of the placenta. So basically, the baby is off, mom is crying, and the baby is out there, and you're, you're still standing there. Usually what you're doing is you're, you're sewing up any lacerations, and you've got a clamped umbilical cord, and at, at, at some point, you're going to get a gush of blood, which is when the, the placenta separates from the uterine wall, and just some gentle traction on that, you should have delivery of the placenta. So that is stage three. And then stage four is kind of, it's more or less loosely defined, but most will define it as the two hours following the delivery. I've even heard some people say two weeks following delivery, but most, most people say two hours following delivery. And it's at this point, the reason that we define this as a stage of labor is because some unique things can happen. Uh, you, can have, you can have hemorrhage, uh, or you can have uh, signs of preeclampsia developing for the first time during this period. This is Friedman's curve. So remember the latent phase. Not a whole lot of dilation going on. Dilation is pretty slow. What's mostly happening here is effacement. Then there's the active phase of stage one. So all this is stage one. The active phase of stage one is where dilation really begins to accelerate. And you go all the way up to 10 centimeters. And once you hit 10 centimeters, now you are in the second stage. All right? So latent and active stage one. So latent stage one in a prima para should be less than 20 hours. And often it's a lot less than 20 hours. In a multipara, though, we expect it to be a little bit shorter for one reason or another. Maybe her uterus has just gotten used to delivering babies by this point. But in a, what may be normal, 16 hours may be normal for a latent stage one in a primapara, but in a multipara, we would consider that delayed. 
All right, so you need to know that for a primapara, latent stage one should be less than 20 hours. For a multipara, it should be less than 14 hours. Active stage one, so the time it takes you to get from four centimeters to 10 centimeters of dilation, in a primapara should be about five to six hours. In a multipara, it should be about four to five hours or less. And you can also determine this based on the rate of cervical dilation. So if you divide up six centimeters, which is four to 10, and you divide that by five to six hours, you get about one to 1.2 centimeters per hour. And the same for a multipara. If you divide six centimeters by four to five hours, you get 1.2 to 1.5 centimeters per hour. Okay, that's the rate of cervical dilation that we should see between four and 10 centimeters dilation. Stage two is while the mom is pushing. Okay, mom shouldn't be pushing. If she's a primapara, she shouldn't be pushing for more than two hours. So once she's fully dilated, it shouldn't be more than two hours till that baby is delivered. For a multipara, it shouldn't be more than one hour until the baby is delivered. Now, if mom has had, if she's had spinal anesthesia, you have to add an hour to this, okay? Because it's a little bit harder for mom to feel when the contractions are, and she's maybe not pushing as hard because she doesn't feel anything down there. So you have to add an hour to that for what's normal. So if mom has received spinal anesthesia, and a lot of them do, very few women nowadays uh, go without, then it's going to be three hours, and for a multipara, it's going to be two hours if she's received spinal anesthesia. In stage three, how long does it take for the placenta to come out? For all women, it should be no more than 30 minutes. Okay, so the cardinal movements of delivery. This is very, very important because this whole process allows the maximal diameter of the baby's head, and that would be the what's called occipital frontal diameter, from the front of the baby's head to the back of the baby's head. I'm going to just call that the AP diameter uh, because you're going anterior to posterior, and occipital frontal is kind of a mouthful. Uh, we want the maximal diameter of the baby's head, that AP diameter, to correspond with the maximal diameter of the maternal uh, of the maternal pelvis. Okay, so this is where it gets tricky. And I'm going to give you this brief anatomy lesson here. At the level of the pelvic inlet, the widest diameter is going from side to side. It's the transverse diameter. Okay, at the level of the pelvic inlet, it's about 13.5 centimeters, whereas the AP diameter is about 10.5 centimeters. Now, because of the ischial spine, note that the ischial spine kind of curves towards the midline. What that's doing is it's narrowing the transverse diameter so that when you get to the level of the mid pelvis, the transverse diameter is actually narrower than the AP diameter. And so what does that mean for baby? Well, that means that when the baby is going through the pelvic inlet, we want the baby to be in this direction. We want the baby to be, and this triangle here is the posterior fontanelle, we want the baby to be in an occiput transverse position because this widest part of the baby's skull is corresponding with the widest diameter, the transverse diameter uh, of the maternal pelvis, okay, at the level of the pelvic inlet. But as it continues to descend, the widest diameter is actually the AP diameter. And so what do we want to happen? We want the baby's head to rotate, okay? So keep that in mind. So the first three steps as the baby is descending is engagement, where the fetal part enters the pelvis, descent, where it descends into the, in the pelvis, and flexion. All these three steps kind of occur simultaneously. So you have engagement, descent, basically descent all together, and then flexion. And when it flexes, it just barely narrows that presenting part, that presenting diameter. Okay, and that's why flexion is so important. So engagement, descent, and flexion. And it should be in the occiput transverse position because you're roughly at the level of the, uh, of the pelvic inlet. Now, as you cross the pelvic inlet and go to the mid-pelvis, remember that that transverse diameter narrows and the AP diameter is actually longest. So what do we want the baby's head to do? We want it to rotate so that the widest diameter of the baby's head is now in the AP direction. Okay, and so to achieve this, we do internal rotation. The posterior fontanelle, the occiput, is rotating towards the midline. That's internal rotation. And so internal rotation is a critical part of these cardinal movements. 
the fetal head rotates from a transverse position to a more AP position. And ideally, we want it to move occiput anterior. Okay, so as that happens now, the fetal head is corresponding more properly with the mid pelvis. Now, as the fetal head begins to cross the symphysis pubis, we want the head to extend. Okay, so it's kind of swimming out underneath the symphysis pubis. Okay, so now we want to move from a flex position to an extended position. And then finally, we need external rotation. Why do we need external rotation? Well, by the time the baby's head crosses the symphysis pubis, the head is now delivered. Okay, that's good. But now what do we need to deliver? We need to deliver the shoulders. And when you're in the occiput anterior position, what direction are the shoulders going to be in? They're going to be in this direction, transverse. And that's not good because now the biggest diameter of the baby is in the transverse position, but we need it to be in the AP direction. And so now the baby is going to externally rotate so that the shoulders, the biacromial diameter, they call it, is in the AP direction. And so this is going to go back. Okay, the baby's going to move back to this transverse position. That's external rotation because the occiput is moving back to a transverse position. This is also called restitution. Okay, so the baby's moving back to a transverse. And that allows so that the shoulders are now oriented in such a way that it's with the AP, the longest uh, diameter of the mid pelvis. And this helps you deliver that very first shoulder. And that's the anterior shoulder. So the anterior shoulder will come out first. And that's very important because once the anterior shoulder is delivered, once that gets out from underneath the symphysis pubis, it's pretty easy to deliver the posterior shoulder. It's really that anterior shoulder that's going to give you the most grief. Okay, so external rotation helps you deliver the shoulders. And once the shoulder is delivered, the anterior shoulder is delivered, the final step, which I didn't put here, is expulsion. Then the posterior shoulder gets delivered, and now you have a nice, happy, cute baby. Okay, and you're done with the second stage of labor. Okay, so these are the steps. Engagement, flexion, descent, those first three steps. You're continuing to, to descend, and you internally rotate. Okay, so now... See, baby is facing you here. It's oriented transverse. Now it's oriented occiput anterior. And then as it comes out, now the head is delivered. Now we need to get those shoulders delivered. So it's going to move back to occiput transverse. You get that first shoulder out. And then uh, you do some uh, manipulation of the head to allow you to deliver the posterior shoulder. You just apply very gentle traction on the baby's head. But what, what obstetricians call gentle traction, you're dealing with a delicate little seven pound baby. You think you gotta be really gentle? No, you actually are gonna apply a decent amount of force. Um, it feels like you're hurting the baby, but you're really not. Uh, so once you get that head out uh, and, and you get that first shoulder out, baby's going to come out pretty easily. And I remember the very first baby I delivered, my preceptor told me, catch it like a football, catch it like a football. And I swear, you catch it just like a football. I'm talking about an American football here. You catch it just like a football. And that baby was so slimy. And I feel like I almost dropped it. And I probably did. And that would have been absolutely awful. But thankfully, I've never dropped a baby before. So... These are the cardinal movements. Very important for making sure that the head and the shoulders are aligning properly with the pelvic dimensions. So finally, just talk about management of the parturient or the mother in labor. So you want to admit when the cervix is dilated to three centimeters or there's been rupture of membrane. Why do we want to admit at three centimeters? Because it's so long. If you're at one or two centimeters, it's such a long time. And we don't want mom to be in the hospital that long. Uh, so we want to wait until about three or four centimeters. Then at that point, we admit her. What are our orders when we put into the computer? We want IV access in case anything really seriously goes wrong. We want to start IV fluids as well. 
clear liquid diet. Why? Because in the event that she needs an emergent C-section, we want her stomach to be empty. You want to notify anesthesia. They want, they, you want them to be ready to come give her a spinal uh, for, so that she's, if, if she wants a spinal. Uh, you also want them to be aware that you've got a woman who's delivering uh, so that in case there's an emergency C-section, they're ready to, to, to come on board. And then uh, continuous fetal monitoring okay, to check for any signs of fetal distress should they be present. Uh, let nursing know that a left lateral decubitus position is encouraged, really any decubitus position. Basically what we want to do is we want to keep her from the supine position because if she's in the supine position, and it really goes for all pregnancy, in the supine position you're compressing the inferior vena cava, it reduces cardiac output, and what happens if you reduce cardiac output? You reduce the blood flow to the placenta and that can cause issues for the fetus. So you want to be in a lateral decubitus position. Left or right, I'm not sure it matters a whole lot, but left lateral decubitus is always what you hear. Okay, nursing will know that. You deal with OB nurses, they probably know more than a lot of obstetricians because they're around it all the time. Obstetricians pretty much only come up to deliver the baby or something seriously wrong. You don't want to start pushing until you're at full dilation. That's pretty clear. Hopefully you understand that. And you want to coordinate it with contractions. The difficulty here is that if a mom gets anesthesia, she doesn't necessarily know she's getting contractions, and so that's where that tocometer is useful, so that you can see when mom is having contractions and you can coach her to push at that point. Because she's going to get the most bang for her buck if she's pushing in coordination with her contractions. Administer IV oxytocin immediately after the delivery. Well, you might think, why? Oxytocin is to help deliver the baby. Yes, but oxytocin is also useful to help contract that uterus. And by contracting that uterus, you reduce the risk of uterine atony and hence hemorrhage. So you give oxytocin right after baby is delivered to reduce that risk and help uh, also help deliver the placenta. You're really delivering two things, a beautiful baby and a beautiful placenta. Real, actually not. Placenta is really kind of gross looking. Uh, all I could think of the first time I saw a placenta was it looked like a big slice of tomato. It's just nasty. I hate tomatoes the way it is. Okay, and then finally, monitor for at least two hours after delivery, sort of that fourth stage of labor, because that's when some unique things can go wrong. She can have hemorrhage. She can have signs of preeclampsia. And so you want to monitor for at least a couple hours after delivery. Okay, and that's all I have for you. Just a reminder, please sign up for my... Uh, Patreon page is greatly appreciated, all the support.